wow, this is way past chance. And you're right. And of course, all of that was the uh, geocentric model, which is basically looking at a birth chart, looking at what you know your location astrology is, and etc. The stuff you're doing is very interesting to me, and I'm I'm very pleased to be on your show because this is a look that a lot of people who are familiar with astrology don't look at, and that is the heliocentric layout of not only the solar system but also looking at the galactic picture. You know, many many astronomers poo-poo astrology, and, and there was a great divide that happened, I'd say, right at the latter part of the 16th century. Of course, Johannes Kepler was probably one of the more prominent uh, astronomers slash astrologers that really ushered this in. Of course, Darwinism and all this stuff, the Industrial Revolution is really what I believe turn people's minds away from astrology as astronomy and divided the two into the hard sciences versus the astrology. I'm super glad we get a chance to talk because yeah. You know. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, I, I've been looking at your data. I love it. Love it. Um, finally, someone who has a um, an IQ above room temperature who actually sees that this isn't farting cows, SUVs, and humans. <laughs> no. So I'm having trouble with my channel. It just never grows because the message is against mm. the uh, the narrative. You know, it just. Oh. But I can't lie to myself and go back in the box and start doing cat videos. I just know I'm not that kind of guy, you know. I just right, keep right, pushing right. with the truth, and however it comes out in the end, it comes out. No, that's it. Well, you're doing some great work. You a lot of good research there. So yeah. Oh, you are too. I mean, I'm spellbound. Like you know, you just the way you're getting the energetic signatures in with the actual planetary geometry, like how those two things, you know, they used to be in the same science, but now they've kind of just were cut and then the one was woo woo and then you can only look at the planets like where they sit in their orbits now and i'm like no they're yeah. connected electrically energetically electromagnetically so oh god to encompass all that together and spiritually too yeah spiritually. i mean that's that's why i love the nadi and the vedic astrology because you know western um Many of your Western scholars have not gone back and looked into this stuff. You know, most people go to David Pingree and, you know, many different researchers. And there are documents sitting in India in the Madras Library. No one knows how to even interpret them. And um, <clears throat> they definitely go back 4,000 years. And some of the yugas and the astronomy and the time cycles are very parallel to what you're looking at, that, that, you know, they looked at 250 million year galactic cycles. But that's the thing that blew my mind was they understood the hundreds of millions of years cycles, but see that that's not the, the thing. So you have to repeat it at least twice to understand it's a cycle. So instead of being right. 200, 220, 230 million years, you, you got to double that. And I'm thinking, Oh, we're talking almost you know, a quarter of a billion years of records. So I look back at this and say, wait, there's something, you know, billions of years older than us on earth, yep. you know. And what is time anyhow? What really, when you look at time, what is time? There, There is no time. That's a Samnastia food. Hi, I'm Chef Antonio with a quick question. What's in your food? Some of the foods these days have some pretty weird ingredients. Foods also have lots of different contaminants from heavy metals to fungicides, pesticides, herbicides. Oh man, that's a lot of no good. Then we got a the cloned food, edited food, fake food, and the unhealthy foods of all kinds. That's not what mama was a cooking when you were a little bambino. You want to know what's in your food? I know you do. Heaven's Harvest has protein booster kit is the bolster of your daily emergency meal plan. Containing only essential proteins, beef, chicken, and eggs stock up on vital amino acids and nutrients required to thrive in all situations. 
They got the fruits and vegetable buckets, the breakfast bucket kits, and for a you health food nuts, they got an organics kit. Now that's knowing what's in your food. They even got the heirloom seed kit so you can plant your own food. Heaven's Harvest Heirloom Vegetable Seed Kit is a simple way to start storing seeds safely. Not sure what varieties are hardy, easy growers, which thrive and taste the best. They have a taken the guesswork and time out of the process of seed saving. Now you know what's in your food because you grew it. Go to heavensharvest.com. You can save 15% at the checkout with code ADAPT. When you look at the mechanics of the celestial you know, universe. I mean, everything is a synodic cycle to either the orbit or rotation of this particular planet. Now you put it uh, somewhere else and everything's going to change completely. Because see, I'm really focused on the, the Birkeland currents and trying to understand that whole flow of energy electromagnetically on those current flows from one star system to another, or actually even in spirals, arms of the galaxy, and how those string of pearls of stars you know, fire up along that same line there. And then when that goes up and down and it's flow of either more electric current in or coming out, you know, of that electromagnetic frequency changes, then how does our star get affected? And then just looking back to the last 8,000 years, obviously you can see, you know, there's there's micro influences in the ebbs and flows of temperature in the interglacial. But when it come into a glacial cycle, I mean, something dramatically changes in that current flow into our star. So oh, there's yeah. like little micro cycles that are within that, that we're witnessing now a couple degrees up, a couple degrees down. But when we come into, you know, ice age cycles, we're look, looking at like 10, 12, 15 degrees Celsius down. Like what triggers that? It's, a, it's like that light bulb in the coffee shop. They turn to the current down, but where does that start from? So that's my whole thing is going way far out, even yeah. past our local star system, looking further back in toward the galactic center. Yeah, that's absolutely. Just no, it's it's great. One of the things that, you know, I went through your data and I actually cast some of these charts for you uh, that you had done on the solar model. And um, here, if I can share my screen real briefly here, I'll show you what I'm speaking about. And, you know, you've hit some very interesting points where the squares of the gas giants, well, <clears throat> first and foremost, um, what you know we're looking at here is the difference between heliocentric astrology, which is really what astronomers today use. They're they're looking at the solar system from a solar viewpoint. Um, all the planets go around the sun, right? Which is essentially what you had uh, done on that PDF that you had sent me, which I, I liked a lot. In fact, let me come back to that and see if I can locate that thing. Yeah, I think it's right here, right? So um, these these were interesting because when you look at this, <clears throat> this is what we call a heliocentric uh, centric model, which is essentially looking at the sun as the center of the solar system like it is. And even the flat earthers have to concede that this you know, model definitely seems to hold up in that sense, where astrologers primarily look at things from a geocentric standpoint, which mm -hmm. is again the Earth-based geo, right? And you know, when you when you get into astrology and readings and all of that, uh, that that's where people they're interested in their own lives. They're interested in cycles that happen to them or to the world or to you know various different personal things. And you know, I was always very much into science and music and you know i had a studio and we did all kinds of music and film production it was a lot of fun back in the 70s and 80s and i got out of it in the mid 90s <clears throat> and what's fascinating my mother turned me on to astrology and in the mid 70s she was like jeffrey you know this girl is not you know going to be this way and that way i'm like you know how do you know and she said well because i have their chart and i said Come on, I said, this stuff doesn't work, right? And she, she laughed. My mother was very intelligent. She was a, uh, a hemodialysis specialist. She started out as an LPN, then RN, and then moved up into various areas of specialty in medicine. And uh, I, I knew she was, you know, no wacko, and, and she was very intelligent. And she said, take a look at this before you just sweep it under the table. And that's when, you know, I really got an eye opening. I went, wow, this is way past chance. And you're right. And of course, all of that was the uh, geocentric model, which is basically looking at a birth chart, looking at what, you know, your location astrology is and et cetera. 
the stuff you're doing is very interesting to me, and I'm I'm very pleased to be on your show because this is a look that a lot of people who are familiar with astrology don't look at, and that is the heliocentric layout of not only the solar system but also looking at the galactic picture. You know, many, many astronomers poo-poo astrology, and, and there was a great divide that happened, I'd say, right at the latter part of the 16th century. Of course, Johannes Kepler was probably one of the more prominent uh, astronomers slash astrologers that really ushered this in. Of course, Darwinism and all this stuff, the Industrial Revolution is really what I believe turn people's minds away from astrology as astronomy and divided the two into the hard sciences versus the uh, astronomy uh, or an astrology, I should say. So <clears throat> what was fascinating for my journey is in the 80s, I uh, got a hold of Robert Hand and Robert Schmidt and Robert Zolar. These are the three who started a project called Project Hindsight. And they went way back into the Chaldean, the Egyptian, and of course, uh, Mesopotamia, which is also known as Iraq, which is kind of believed to be by most historians, the Western cradle of civilization. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, the, the astrology, astronomy, as it matriculated up into the Middle Ages, where it really crescendoed. But then I was also blessed <clears throat> to get exposed in the mid to late 80s uh, with Vedic astrology. And Vedic astrology is really kind of a pop term. Its real name is known as Jyotisha. In fact, let me put that on the screen here. This is kind of fascinating. Uh, Jyotisha is also known as Vedic astrology. And in fact, a friend of mine named Chakrapani, many people may have heard of him. He was quite famous. He came from India in the 60s. And he's, he just passed away here a few years back. And I used to go out to dinner with him and Howard Beckman, and very nice guy. And, he, and I said, you know, how'd you come up with his name, Vedic Astrology? And he said, well, I knew Americans would never understand Jyotisha. <clears throat> so he said, I, I, I coined the phrase Vedic Astrology. And I said, wow, if you're probably the guy who came up with that. And uh, he said, I think so. And uh, essentially, Jyotisha means the science of the light of the spirit and the soul. And that really caught my eye. And uh, I started studying it. It's very hard to study Vedic and Nadi astrology because you're not only dealing with a much more complex type of astrology of the soul, but you're also dealing with a, a whole, you could say, outlook of philosophical approach to who the hell are we having a physical experience on this earth. And that really comes down to where spiritual beings having a physical experience. And you can see here on the screen, and I'll, I'll highlight this here, this white etheric energy is the magical energy science cannot measure. You cannot put a meter to it. You cannot quantify it. It's not gravity. It's not magnetic. It's not any frequency. It is a very, very divine etheric energy. Quick question. You know, you sure. were talking about the uh, the the blood there. I think it was with your mother and how she was, uh, you know, working with the hemoglobin and this sort of thing. Like, with the, does the uh, blood change? And can you see energetic changes in the blood on certain uh, days, weeks, or months? Get, is there actual measurable change in the uh, electric flow or the electric charge in the blood itself? In these cycles you know, that are also within us that you're referencing here with etheric energies, but can it also be a physical energy change and mappable through? Uh, that's why people freak out when they get blood transfusions. They got all this new energy of somebody else coming into them. Is that is that a thing or am I just stretching on no, that? No, I, th I think you're right on with that one. I, I really have to say, you know, again, I'm not a, a professional in medicine, but I can tell you uh, I've been around a lot of people. I have a lot of clients who are in Essentially, yes. Does does it show up in physical energies? You bet. Location astrology, which is fascinating. I've worked with doctors where we have put gemstones on people. I actually make gemstone talismans for people. And this is very much throughout all the religious history and, of course, the kingdoms and the pharaohs and all this. They knew that gemstones had a very magical power of resonating with the celestial influences. Of course, the best example is the breastplate of Aaron. And 
What's interesting about all of this is that also location astrology as well. See, location astrology is literally showing where your energies are across the globe. And I have to tell you, each individual will have their birth chart, um, which is printed at first breath, it is believed. And I can tell you, I've, I had one doctor, he had prostate cancer. He said, Jeff, I'm dying. He said, I've tried everything under the sun. What can I do? And I said, well, Jim, why don't you try going on a sun ascending line? And he did. And his PSAs dropped out of the sky. Now, that's measurable lab work. That's science that literally said, oh, my God, I, I felt such an energetic change. But he said, I also measured it in the blood work. So, you know, when you talk about, and it's such a good thing you brought up, David, and that is that when we speak about the physical vessel, we're, it is believed that we are tied at, at the conception of the embryo with a silver cord by an angelic force, call it a guardian angel, if you will. And that assignment stays there until we exit the womb known as birth. And they actually say when we exit the womb that at the very first breath, the guardian angel waits for the proper celestial alignment to imprint that celestial print on the body. So modern astrologers run around and say, oh, you know, you're a Libra, you're a Scorpio, you're this— I say it's the other way around. Literally, the astrology may be us. It may be where the soul is in its evolution on this planet. And I think Earth is one place of many where spirit becomes manifest. So when we look at the celestial influences, the ancient astrologers were astronomers, and they knew that the motions of the heavens not only brought great changes in the in, inner being, and also you can see longevity. I'm I'm stunned at Nadi and Vedic astrology. You can generally see when you're going to exit the physical plane, and uh, this is powerful stuff. I I see so many times where someone will pass on, and the configurations in the Nadi birth chart were right on. Or spot on. So we're clearly, I always say, forget Trinity, Neo, and Morpheus. We're in a matrix here. A government can't control the economy without controlling people. And they know when a government sets out to do that, it must use force and coercion to achieve its purpose. That's why we must steer our own future. For the last 10,000 years at least, gold has rarely suffered from economic and political crises, as it has always been a stable. Gold is perceived as a symbol of wealth, power, and majesty. Gold has had an exalted position throughout the ages as a highly coveted, even worshipped material. That's why most every major civilization has collected and saved gold. Gold has maintained its worth and usefulness as currency throughout time and will continue to do so. Gold has an important economic role as a means of exchange should currency collapse. Insurance that will protect you and your families against financial turmoil of any kind. ITM Trading is a precious metals company that has been in business for over 27 plus years with a mission to educate and empower individuals to hedge against inflation, mitigate financial risk, and prepare for the Great Reset. Schedule your free gold and silver strategy call, 866-834-1422, 866-834-1422. And now on with the video. So can you bend that physical substance is more the question. I and then when can you, yes. at like what points in the energetic flow of what we consider astronomy, are you able to bend the physical in an easier manner? And that's why a lot of things I'm looking at in the celestial uh, alignments coming up in 2024. Uh, I really feel there's something to this. And the reason the elite oh, yeah. are in yeah. such a fervent push right now to stifle humanity's growth spiritually. Just my thought though. That's for sure. And boy, they are. And when we look at, the astrology or astronomy, if you will, of the United States, I think the 
I've been warning for years. Many people were worried about the Mayan calendar. I was on many radio shows and people, Jeff, what do you think of the Mayan calendar? And I said, not a single thing. I said, watch out from 2020 forward. I said, in my humble opinion, that's when things are going to really get nuts. And they have. And the reason why we had Saturn and Jupiter join on the winter solstice of 2020, which is ushering I in. I was out in my front field watching that. They came so close together. It almost like a, looked like a figure eight in the sky. They were just, yeah. lights were touching. That was the, a fascinating thing. We had binoculars and telescope and stuff looking at that from the front field. I remember that well. And I thought, wow, yeah. that does seem like a marker in time. And that, you know, if you were going to look and you're looking for signs in the skies and you saw that, that would definitely be a marker with a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. Sorry to cut you off. Oh, no, no, no. And, and I'm so glad you brought that up because it was very visual. Everyone was seeing it. You see, if you go back to the ancient astrology, which really no one knows where it came from, there's many different references to somewhere around three to 4,000 BC. Some of this stuff started becoming very cohesive. And there's many scholars who say, well, but, you know, the, the writing was not very uh, sophisticated. And in the Vedic lore and in, in some of the uh, texts of the Puranas and the Rig Veda and so on and so forth, there's many fascinating texts in Vedic astrology. And they said that we were telepathic back then. We didn't need to write things down. And that's why we got dumbed down in a new yuga. See, when you look at the heliocentric model, our solar system is believed to go around a central sun just short of 26,000 years. Now, no one really knows. I certainly don't. But there's somewhere around 25,700 something odd years, if in the math is correct. So it's a generalized acceptance that somewhere around 2,100 years, our solar system sits in a so-called zodiacal sidereal sign. Now, the sidereal'ists are more in the camp of Vedic and Nadi, and of course, sidereal astrology. The tropicalists use just the solar system based on the solstices and equinoctial points. So, what's interesting about all of this is that the Vedic astrology took it much deeper. They said we were in yugas, and some of these yugas lasted exceedingly long amounts of time. And of course, one of them we mentioned earlier was the 250 million year galactic cycle. And I don't think you can ever get the same thing twice, because as many astronomers will tell you, we've got galaxies moving at us and away from us in all different directions, like like a, a scatter cloud out there. <clears throat> and you could never get the same energy twice. And this is why when you go into the spiritual doctrines of the ancient Hebrew, the ancient rabbinical texts and the Chaldean and the, and the uh, Egyptian, as well as the Vedantic, they, they say there's waves of souls that come through this particular planet for purification and rectification. And, you know, you brought up something a moment ago, which I liked, which you said, can we bend reality? And the answer is yes. I mean, when you look at quantum physics, there was, you know, things done back in the 1800s and 1700s where they did the double slit pattern, where you actually observing matter alter it. <clears throat> and that also gets into various different frequencies of planets and so on and so forth. The biggest one was the Guaclin. The Guaclin tests were amazing because they did a, a number of tests scientifically proving that the celestial influences, quote unquote, astrology absolutely have an effect, not only on human beings, but on matter itself. The congealing of metal. I actually cast metals for pendants and rings at good astrological times to coagulate, if you will, the dross of the metal, whether it's silver, gold, platinum, or whatever it is, um, <clears throat> to form properly. And I can tell you there's molecular data that shows if the alignments of the planets are in hard aspects, particularly Sun and Saturn, squares, oppositions, etc., you will find not only does it affect the human you know, condition in animals, but it also affects the way metals congeal. And just like we see the moon affect the growth and ebbs and flows in, you know, fluids and plants. And of course, the ocean is a, is a big one with the tides. But this is powerful, powerful stuff. <clears throat> in fact, the Vedic astrologers believed that literally the planets were called graha, 
which means Caesar or grasper of the aura. And, and like I say, forget Trinity, Neo, and Morpheus, we have a true matrix of the soul here. So the stuff you're working on about this change could be precipitated definitely celestially. And <clears throat> I think it's a spiritual effect of where everything is at. You know, nobody drawing breath can explain why our planet is at a 23 degree, 44 minute angle, nor the other planets. There's not a guy in the sky with a string holding them there. So this this whole solar system appears to be like a fixed standing wave insofar as its orbital positions and differences. And of course, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have the um, asteroid belt, which there's an ancient Sumerian legend that that was actually a war and the planet was destroyed and all of the solar system changed. It, it locked into a new pattern. And I think these patterns are clearly uh, depicted by consciousness. I, I really believe that uh, it, it is the effect or a matrix, if you will, like a, uh, like a celestial machine that is interacting with the soul. And we have to realize, you know, D David, uh, I don't know if you're or not, not David, it was Anthony Peake. I don't know if you've heard of him, but interesting guy. He's, he's brought up that the mind <clears throat> acts like an attenuator. And I absolutely believe that he's right. Um, the conscious mind is clearly an attenuator. It, it It's blocking us. In fact, um, to go back to screen sharing one more time, I want to show you one of my favorite diagrams. Um, this is a an amazing diagram on the human psyche. And it actually, <clears throat> a lot of people call it the Kabbalah, but it's actually much older than that. The Kabbalah is kind of a pop term. This big thick dash line here is kind of the division between what modern psychology might call the division between the so-called conscious mind down here and the subconscious mind above this line. And a better uh, maybe picture to kind of elucidate how the human body might fit into that is like this. And it's interesting because when you look at genetics and you look at consciousness, our lower conscious mind is formed in the womb. And just like Dark Side of the Moon said, all that we touch, all that we see, all that we feel is, is pretty much influenced by the lower celestial energies. Well, the Hebrews had a very interesting name for this. They called the lower conscious mind the nefesh. And there's been many texts written about this. The nefesh is also a, a, a synonym to, you could say, just our present personality, right? <clears throat> it's not us. It's the keyboard, the mouse, and the screen, or if you will, the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brakes, that we control these miraculous physical bodies, but it's not us. And it's almost like an avatar garment we put on to come into these lives to play out with free will. And I don't believe the astrology totally dictates it. In fact, the Vedic scriptures and many of the Upanishads speak specifically that there are certain karmas we came in to share with our ancestral and inner relationships with various different people that we marry, divorce, whatever we do, uh, have, you know, good times, bad times with. And that the there are other karmas we're creating. And of course, us Westerners, when we hear the word karma, we always get a little nervous, right? We say, well, geez, karma has got to be bad, right? Well, you can have good karma too. And this seems to be shown in the celestial matrix at the time of birth through the Nadi astrology exceedingly accurately. You know, I always go back to Evangeline Adams. She was tried in court for fraud and the judge tested her and she said, well, this particular person that you handed the horoscope to probably is going to die of a, a water accident. And the judge said, that's my son. He just died a couple of years ago in a water. He drowned. So he dismissed the case. So again, astrology has been tried many times and the skeptics are always going to be skeptics. They're, they're always going to poo poo it. And the hard scientists will never cross that bridge until they open up to it. But what I love about the ancient, rabbinical texts and models 
which parallel eerily close to the Hunas and the Egyptians and the Chaldeans and the, you know, Vedantic stuff, is that we are dumbed down to play in these meat suits called bodies. And then we will leave. And notice Saturn is the cross over the crescent of the moon. See, all the glyphs of the planets are combinations of the sun, the moon, and the cross. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's Jeff Harmon Astrologer. I really encourage people to look at that. It has a lot of various different uh, you know, YouTube channels or, or videos on there that talk about the soul and the glyphs of the planets and all of that. But this is an interesting model because we begin to see that we're not what the religions have taught us we are. We, we are you know, there's a lot of truth in religions, but there's they've also sorely failed in this respect. It's become dogmatic and very closed down, almost antithesis in some ways to consciousness, some of them, and um, and questioning. And uh, I, I would say another one of my favorite uh, diagrams is this one. Uh, they say somewhere way above any celestial universes, our soul was created up here. And this is a word called absolute in the Aramaic and Hebrew, which means where the divine emanation of spirit is created. And these are the classes of angels that are believed to rule this. They say there's 49 dimensions and 49 subdimensions in this, exceedingly vast. No astrology, no celestial bodies. The next world's down Abraya, which is where the waters of creation get much more dense. And they say there's 49 dimensions, 49 subdimensions in this. Then you get into something called Yetzirah, which is a strange word that means formation. This is where the celestial mechanics, the rotating galaxies, the gas clouds, the universes, quote unquote, are believed to exist. And they claim there could be 49 parallel universes and 49 subdimensions in each one. I don't know about you, David, but that's way past my comprehension. You know, that's that's pretty deep. <clears throat> and then you've got the final worlds, the astral planes known as Asaya. And again, 49 dimensions, 49 subdimensions. And now we start looking at, well, who are we on this little planet called Earth? We seem to keep coming back here for multiple amounts of times until we escape from Alcatraz and head somewhere else. And the soul seems to be indestructible. And that's the theory, or theology at least, behind this, is that some point in what we would like to call time and our comprehension, the collective incarnations regroup, and then that goes back up into the divinity of the soul. So this is deep stuff, but it makes sense. And you know, going back to your work, which I, I yeah, really Yeah, can I like. stop you for a second, Jeff? Like, if you can leave that one up there, the tree of life, and you can you come to the 2024 alignment where the earth passes through the sun? Uh, yeah, because yeah. I, I see part of the, the tree of life in that uh, planetary geometry coming up in 2024. Ah, oh, I see what you were saying, yeah. Yeah, and now that's a 2020. Yeah, I actually cast that here, um, and I called it 23, but it's actually 24. So let's do this. Let's see if we can't bring this and size these parallel. Now, this is a geocentric chart. It's not going to look the same as that really pretty diagram you had. Um, oh, no, that's the one. If you could take a look at because if you spin it to the a little bit, you'll see those four gas giants look very similar to uh, the tree of life and actually a physical representation of the planets, which kind of sparked my thought there. Yeah, like yeah. there, you'll see yeah. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune creating this square that's above, and then the ego would be the sun, and then the Earth will pass through the center there. And also, uh, I think it's Eris, would, which would take the place in the uh, in the upper soul area there. But it's, it seems very representational of having the four gas giants, the sun where it would be, right. and uh, at least part of that, perhaps it's the beginning of the cycle. And then the ending of the cycle is somewhere where we come out and we can actually physically see that the bottom portion of the tree of life takes shape. And that would be the beginning and then the ending of the cycle. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, it, there's no question, you know, George Nori on Coast to Coast asked me a really good question here about a year ago. <clears throat> it kind of caught me off guard and I really liked it. 
he he said, Jeff, just what is astrology? And I thought, wow, that's a simple but really great question. What is astrology? What is these heavens? What what are these celestial, you know, things called stars and planets and all this? And that brings me back to here. My opinion is at this point, I'm not claiming I absolutely know, but from all the texts I can glean, the celestial matrix, also known as the universe, seem to be transmissional portals that transmit the soul force energy down into the physical realms. It's almost like an interconnected machine between spirit, consciousness, and all of that stuff transmitted down into the physical world. We literally have a genetic reality machine here. And when you look at the earth, it's where spirit manifests into physical bodies. And think about this. You know, I, I remember being born and I, my first rub with astral travel was right around seven years old. And that's an interesting number too, because every seven years, science tells us all the molecules and the atoms and all the things in the body change. And they're right, they do. You know, the cells all change. And or they, they transmute, if you will. Well, it's interesting because the seventh year from birth is a Saturn year. There's literally, that's where the seven-year itch comes from. Marriages break up, you know, on threes and seven, because that's Mars and Saturn, see? The third year of a marriage is Mars. The third year of a business is Mars. The seven-year itch. I, I have a lot of this stuff on my YouTube. It's really fascinating stuff. Well, long story short, I was sleeping upstairs in my bedroom, about seven years old. And I had these little guinea pigs. And I had this dream that I was downstairs next to the cage. And I saw my little guinea pig, I think her name was Peggy or something, died on her side. And I woke up and I jumped up and I ran downstairs. And sure enough, exactly the way I just dreamt it, I mean, to the tea, the smell and everything. And I even saw myself opening up the door to grab her. And uh, of course, as a kid, you know, you get very emotional. So we, we gave her a little burial and all that. But my mother said to me, because I told her the whole story, she goes, you asked to travel. And I said, what's that? You know, seven-year-old kid. I don't know what that is, right? It's back in the 60s, right? And she said, uh, you you left your body and you your consciousness went outside and was experiencing this event pre facto. So again, we go back to what the heck is time? I don't know what time is. That one thing's for sure, it's a reality structure of this world. We all get up every day. We see the sunrise. We see a cumulate set. And of course, anti cumulate at midnight. And we see the celestial motions and all this. We feel it, the moon and all that. It's very, very much a reality system on this earth. If you put us on a different planet that had a different rotation, that had a different synodic cycle around the sun, time would be totally different. And this is what's very amazing about this planet is we're spiritual beings dumbed down to have an experience. You had mentioned, I, I listened to a number of your podcasts. I found them very interesting and you got a lot of good people. Um, you know, you mentioned Tartaria. So you're definitely familiar with the skewed reality that they painted in our history books. And, you know, the free energy and all this stuff. So clearly... Well, can I, Jeff, can I stop you for a second? I have an answer on this one and the Tartaria both, and they both like please. dovetail like DNA strands. Well, first, the reason that the tilt would be there is because the Earth came into a, a zero magnetic field that allowed that to tilt and wander, which meant something on the sun had to come down to a zero magnetic state or else our Earth could not experience a zero magnetic field. It'd have to be both. So it'd be a solar system wide event. And you were talking about that earlier. Which, if something were to happen in a very light version of that, would be the liquid global liquefaction event or the mud flood, which is also referenced in Tartaria. So th those all kind of swirl in the same mist, if you will, of prehistory or recent history, however you like to look at that. Right on, right on. Um, and clearly, I mean, you look at the pictures of the Chicago World Fair, some uh, of the things. Travesty, uh, they tore those down. Can you believe it? And even Tesla was purported to have had a car that he put an antenna up in the air and he did over a hundred miles an hour, no batteries, you know, no, no diesel charging stations. Uh, and, and he, he went down the road with an electric motor and they wondered, how did you do that? 
You know, I, I always tell people, if you take a wire, just, you know, if you can safely go up and put it up, you know, 20, 30 feet in the air, take a voltmeter, run a wire on one end and put a wire on the other end, you will get hundreds of millivolts. So this isn't rocket science. There's energy everywhere. And this gets back into quantum physics and life and all of it itself. Literally, we are living in a sea of very intelligent, organized energy. And when you start getting into angels and spirits and intelligences, the ancient models, and, and this is where astronomy really shined, um, almost all of your texts prior to the 1600s spoke specifically about how each planet had an archangel, a spirit, an intelligence within it. And it's quite amazing when you start examining this. Here's another copy of that. <clears throat> and you can see, not only do we have that, you have frequencies, you have the archangels, you have the God name. See, these are also known as the sephirotes on the tree of life. And isn't it interesting, you get right down into fragrances and plants. Look, if I zoom in here, what's the quintessential tough guy look? Well, it's a guy smoking a cigar, right? Cigars and pine are all about Mars. Mars, the planet of war, the planet of aggression, the tough guy image. See, so look at here. We have the, the, the sun is rose, jasmine, yellow. You've got mercury, rosemary. In fact, it's proven if you put rosemary on your pulses, I, I do it all the time for reading, so I want to be sharp. It will increase blood flow to the brain. So, in fact, it's used in muscle rubs, rosemary. Why? Because it, it tends to really invigorate the cardiovascular system in a very positive way. The children respond elegantly to, or I, my, my son, uh, when, when he, he hardly ever had crying issues, but what, what's amazing is if you want to calm a child, put some lavender on their pillow. Why? Because lavender rules the emotions and the moon, see? Patchouli used to be regarded as one of the real luxuries in the garment industry, especially back in the Middle Ages. And of course, patchouli rules what? Venus, see? Venus is all about opulence, love, and pleasures, and creativity. So the, this is really interesting stuff, how you know, I don't have the, I have the archangels here, but I don't have the spirits and the intelligences, but uh, I do in another diagram. I just don't have it available right here. But it's very interesting how this stuff was known as a spiritual angelic matrix. Even the Bible itself has something known oh, as the Shem What about the Auth there that you have, the hidden knowledge? So if you, that PowerPoint that I gave you, if you go down and take a look at the 2024 alignment, the earth uh -huh. should be right where the da'ath is, where the hidden knowledge is. Kind of incredible that it would pass through that arena of houses where I really well, believe that's the reason that the world is exactly the way it is today to stop this transmission of this hidden knowledge back to the people because there will be no more control of humanity once this electro, sure. whatever wave it is or whatever we experience electromagnetically is going to be uh, kind of over because. If you're looking at the Kali Yuga and we're rising out of that, now just correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going from a layman's term here. Yeah, we go through the Yuga cycles and we're coming into the Dopara Yuga. So would it every single day should be vibrationally lighter? Is that where I'm getting, you know? And like there, there's we're not going back down in darkness. So these like old systems of iron and heaviness that held us down uh each day that we step a little bit away from that, and they're like a great white shark trying to grab us by the foot and bring us back down. But Humanity is on the ascension pattern, vibrationally going out now, at least to the next round. That That's one theory, yeah. that They say we're coming out of Kali into a tetra. There's oh, tetra. a lot of different, yeah, it, there's a lot of different opinions on that. And I've studied a lot about the yugas. In fact, Chakrapani and I used to speak about that, and Howard Beckman, too. Howard just passed away, too, very sadly from... from uh, uh, cancer. But, um, but bottom line is, um, there is great knowledge in the ancient texts about this. The problem is decoding them. The Puranas speak about this too. There's a, a text called the uh, Bhagavata uh, Purana, which is all about these various waves of souls coming through. I mean, this thing's like a New York telephone book. It's huge. And uh, the, the bottom line is, um, 
it speaks about these yugas or time periods that our solar system as well as the central sun goes through. So it's not just the solar system. We have to remember this central sun is also moving too. And this gets into, you know, the whole element of Nibiru or Nibiru, however you want to pronounce it. Um, there's theories that it's a, you know, outer planet. And then there's also theories that it's a binary sun and that it is whipping around. Now that will definitely play havoc onto the, uh, the, the magnetics and the arrangement of the solar system, that's for sure. And there's ancient legends of this happening. And um, I, I can't say as to when that's going to be. I have studied enough about the Yugas to make my eyeballs cross. And I, I can say nobody can agree on it. And there has been a direct attempt to obfuscate this knowledge, to keep us from fully being... A, able to unravel there's an old saying god uh confused all the astrologers when he divided all the languages and there may be more truth of that than we know the tower of babel story and i can tell you there seems to be a, a consistent legend between the shamans as well as the mystical magical communities and other uh you know ancient texts that there was a war and and this could possibly have had something to do with our asteroid belt. Um, there was a yeah, war. I think it was Tiramit or so. I think that was the original name to the Sumerian myths was Tiramit, and then it collided. Yeah, and that that's what the asteroid belt is, something like that. Something like that. But it, 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 uh, I, the one thing that they said is that there was a war, and the Anunnaki lost, and the Watchers won. And this is also alluded to in the Keys of Enoch and other texts that are very obscure. And I, I find the same thing in the Sanskrit, in the Dravidian, and the Tamil. A lot of these languages are coded in cryptology. They, they literally have ciphers that are within them. In fact, the, the best example of that in the West is the Exodus, the three verses in Exodus, which is the 72 angels and spirits that rule the firmament <clears throat> and that's an interesting little rabbit hole to go down. And again, many of the people in the magical communities also speak a lot about the different... Uh, Are those the Keys of Solomon you're talking about? Well, the Keys of Solomon, yeah, there, there's the lesser and greater keys, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, again, Solomon gets a lot of press in magic because he wrote something called the Goetia. And yeah, that's right, the Goetia. I, I, yeah, I know. Go yeah, however it's pronounced, that's the same... The, the, yeah, the the Goetic uh, documents. And uh, essentially, these ciphers are very deep rabbit holes. And many of the Aramaic and Hebrew uh, was, I'm just paging through here. Yeah, here's, there's all kinds of things about the celestial matrix, how you could enter certain scriptures into various different tables and derive the meaning of, of angels. And this is pretty cool stuff because I, I have to tell you. Yeah, I look actually, at that table. It just goes straight down the middle in a diagonal line, straight down there. It was all the same character, oh, yeah. whatever that yeah, was it, on the last sure one, does. right through the middle there. See that? You can see that's the Aleph, right? And see, Aleph is the first letter, which is also A in the Aramaic and Hebrew alphabet. So, yeah, this isn't just somebody screwing around here playing tic-tac-toe. This is very complex, detailed stuff. And each planet has sigils, or you could say a spiritual symbol. They call them angelic squares. In the far east, they call them yantras. The, and many people in cymatics believe that these were sacred geometry that were formed by the chants that were done with the mantras when when they um, would do that and when they would actually chant the mantras and i i can tell you i actually do uh here i'll show you something on my website i do angelic uh angels for a lot of people and you can see here um these are various different gems that I make for people. And you can see this is the inner seven planets of the solar system of your birth chart, followed by Aleph Lamed. Now, this is very interesting because it's derived by taking the eastern horizon and positioning the exact position, minutes and degrees, of each of the inner seven planets in uh, from Saturn in. 
uh, at the first breath, at, at, at the time you were born. And here's what's even more interesting. The gamatria, which is also known as numerology, chimera, and there's all different phrases. There's um, gamatria, chimera, akhbiker, and, and uh, various different techniques that you, you can look at correlations to the Old Testament and the Psalms, the Psalms are really more interesting because to me, not, not that the, the, the biblical stuff isn't, but just saying the Psalms could potentially be 4,000 plus years old. No one knows. I, I certainly don't. And it's known as Tehillim. And when you get into the ancient texts, there are actually angel names that are literally put alongside of the verses. And each psalm was for a specific chant and purpose, which I believe invoked that angelic force. And so I put the guardian angel, which is one of many in a person's chart. They actually say you can get the angel that's kind of the demonic angel that's your tempter. It's kind of like Animal House. You got a good one and a bad one, right, on each side. And um, the bottom line is I only calculate the good one. And there's a lot of ancient methods to this. And it's very fascinating what comes up in a person's numerology to the biblical correspondences. So again, this goes full circle back to we're in a matrix. We're literally in a spiritual matrix um, of the soul. And it's very interesting because what you're studying, I think the geometric configurations and the magnetics and all this is very accurate. I, I think we're likely to see something by 2025.